This one is called the 10 Great Demon Lords and 10 Sura Explained. Demon Lord versus True Demon Lord from Mr. Annie News. Let's get it. With Walpurgis being right around the corner, I figured now would be a good time to set aside all this talk about Rimuru and finally focus on something a little bit different. Okay. An introduction to the unique cast of characters that make up what's known as the 10 Great Demon Lords. Not only will I be covering the details- Like, Clayman is actually a great demon lord, huh? We got uh, Mr. Earthquake guy, big guy, big boy, right? Leon Cromwell, Ramirus. Ramirus looks so imposing here. Guy Crimson, Milim. This light novel art is crazy. Then we have uh, the guy from Eurasania, the beast dude. Luminous, Clayman, Roy, Harpy, Sky Queen, and Dino. But like, Clayman, really? Amongst these greats? Clayman? Really? regarding their rise to the top of the food chain, but I'll also include other spoiler-free bits and pieces of who they are. Things that weren't quite shown in the anime. So, let's continue with our Tensida Explain series and take let's a closer go. look at these demon lords and the even more powerful true demon lords. But first, before we start... But first, this video is sponsored... Red Shoes in the Wood Bear World, you know what time it is. A new fucking sponsor. Use your discount code, fucking Annie News, and back to the regular content. Let's get back to the video. Yeah. There's a very big difference between a demon lord and a true demon lord. Because a demon lord is simply a title. It is. Because, like, a, a true demon lord is when you have the demon lord factor, the seed, and then you go through the whole harvest ritual or something and 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 then like the, even the voice of the world like declares that you became a true demon lord right after giving it enough souls one is just a social position in which any capable person or monster can declare or be given while the yeah. other is a formal stage of evolution that coincides with one of the ultimate forms of existence so when talking about the 10 great demon lords that we'll be seeing at Walpurgis, it's important to know that not even half are true awakened demon lords like how mm. milim or rimuru are some like, like, I don't think Sky Queen Harpy, you know, carry on Clayman. Of course he's not. Like, Geek Crimson, I could believe Ramirez, Geek Crimson, Luminous, I don't know. I, th these are spoiler details, so I don't want to know who they are, but I have a feeling. Some are still seeds hoping to complete their evolution, while others are a holy being or species that simply can't become true demon lords. Oh. Oh. She literally can't. That's interesting. Same with this guy? Okay. The one thing in common between all of them, though, is that each possess a level of strength worth noticing. Every demon lord carries a threat level that's at least at the S rank or above, placing each in a class that's known to be more than capable of leveling a small nation. Combat form. As for the difference in power for those above that. What the fuck is a special S rank? Gi Crimson. Bro, what is this imagery of Rimuru like turning into like Red Skull here? Holy. Well, let's just say that the scale isn't even fathomable. There's a significant disparity in power between those who are at the top and those who aren't. Sure, some of them could be fairly- <laughs> You really have to do Sky Queen Harpy that dirty? Carry on, Sky Queen and Clayman, bro. <laughs> he just- he immediately just dumpsters on them, those who have, and those that don't, bro. Power between those who are at the top and those yeah. who aren't. <laughs> sure, some of them could be fairly equal, but there's others like Gi and Milam who simply make the rest pale in comparison. As for why those weaker demon lords are even called that in the first place, yeah, why? Well, that's mainly because of the way that it's seen as a social position. You see, in the world of Tensida, there's more than one way to become a demon lord. There's the evolution approach that I talked about last video, then the Harvest extremely Festival. more risky social approach which I'll briefly talk about here. To put it simply, if a being like let's say Ramorous isn't capable of acquiring a demon lord seed, then that means becoming a true demon lord isn't a possibility for them. Due to the nature of her being like a fucking spirit pixie, whatever she is, just can't have a seed. Same with the big boy, huh? Their only other options are to then either declare themselves one or have their power. Yeah, what do you mean? I'm a, I'm a, d just declare? You can straight up just say, I, Clayman, am a demon lord. And everyone's like, okay, they just accept you? Be recognized by an existing demon lord. The former is certainly an option that literally any monster or person can do, but the moment that declaration is made is the moment that that power will be tested. Power will be tested. Some other people will show up and be like, you really a demon lord? Either by a rival demon lord, their closest subordinates, or even a whole nation of humans trying to kill you. Okay. So like, it's not in their best interest to just casually say I'm a demon lord for shits and giggles if you're not that strong. Because this title 
is a huge threat that could be. Like, it's a potential threat. And these other people will actually challenge and be like, oh shit, new demon lord? We gotta fucking check this out. Now, the other option definitely isn't any easier, but it doesn't put you in a position to be hunted by what's literally the strongest beings in the world. Instead, you simply have to gain recognition. Whether that comes from- That is crazy, dude. Her ass is literally slipping out. Where is that scene? ...doesn't put you in a position to be hunted by what's literally the strongest beings in the world. Instead, you simply have to gain yeah. recognition. Like, bro, it's not even on. Like, this is the longest butt crack I've ever seen in anime. It's- that's not even on. Whether that comes from killing another demon lord, or simply putting on a display of power that impresses existing ones, the end goal here is to gain their approval. Only then can you be nominated to join their ranks. So, now that you know the difference between a demon lord and a true demon lord, let's go through every person that's currently part of the ten great demon let's lords. Go. The existing council that we'll be seeing at Walpurgis. Octagram! I won't be showing any spoilers, but I will be talking about details that didn't make it into the anime. So, first we have the Platinum Devil, Leon Cromwell. Leon Cr a self-proclaimed demon lord who ascended himself all the way from the lowly status of human almost 200 years ago. And he is a hero that fell off? What was the lore? In the anime, they talked about how Leon used to be some kind of hero that fell off. Self-declared demon lord. So he just said, alright, I'm a demon lord now. I also know that he is a huge, huge, maybe soon today, I'm not sure. But also a huge debate lord. As the most recent addition to the Council of Demon Lords, his rise to such a standing was one that not many had been able to see in quite a few centuries. Mainly because people don't usually declare themselves to be a demon lord like the way that he did. Remember, not only do you need an immense level of power to back up your claim of being as strong as a demon lord, yeah, but because... you also take on the risk of attracting the wrath of the other demon lords who you're essentially challenging. So, when Leon- Is battle against demon lords forbidden? Hold up, why am I starting to think this now? Was there ever a rule that forbid demon lords from attacking each other? Am I crazy? Why am I starting to think that? But basically, if you ever declare yourself, like, self-proclaimed seems kind of crazy that anyone can just do that. But people will challenge you, so you need to be very careful about it. But other demon lords will just come by and spar you, huh? ...had done exactly that. The world was shocked to see him actually have the latent power to back it up. It was a very rare feat in which he alone could accomplish. A display of power that granted him the demon lord title permanently. As for what exactly happened... Well, there was a time 200 years ago when Leon had begun to amass a large army of Majin. Oh? It's not like he was doing so for any nefarious purposes, but it was more like these magic-born creatures found his charm to be alluring. So, once a large enough army- <laughs> He just- People just gather around, they're like, damn, this guy has riz. This, this guy has aura, bro. Platinum- Platinum Saber? Oh my god, I wanna follow him. So he had like a huge army of fans, okay? He found his charm to be alluring. So, once a large enough army had been established, Leon simply decided to declare himself the lord of the territory he was in. <laughs> An action that did well to anger the nearest demon lord known as the Cursed Lord. Cursed the instant lord. this Cursed Lord heard of this news, he immediately declared war on Leon and set out with his armies to crush him. I'm gonna assume that Leon just decimated the Cursed Lord. Not once considering that perhaps he could lose. But to his surprise, what? this Cursed Lord quickly found his forces to be completely annihilated by Leon alone. There easy, easy. Demon Lord Leon Cromwell solo, not even with the help of his army, no followers, just soloed. There wasn't a single person other than Leon who had acted to repel the invading forces of this already established Demon Lord, Damn. making this one of the rare occasions where a Demon Lord had made their debut through a pure display of power. Of course, he could just have taken the safer approach and gained the backing of two other Demon Lords, but I guess for someone like Leon, the more like he would never stoop down that low because he's he's not is he arrogant he's prideful i think he knows that he's strong he can do it he wouldn't ask for help unless he absolutely fucking needed it right A part i just feel like his personality is not suited to ask out for help like that more aggressive option was easier i mean rallying up an opposing demon lord then bending them off in battle was certainly a valid method of recognition as well in any case, it was after this that Leon would continue to make himself more powerful. Not only by honing his current set of skills, but also by expanding his sphere of influence with some very notable allies. Yee. That said, 
He certainly wasn't a stranger to any disputes either. As a person who wasn't too fond of Clayman himself, the two were always working to undermine the other's plans. Sure, they may not show their mutual disdain to the eyes of the public, but everyone knew that they were always doing what they could to keep track of the other's movements. That's hilarious. And it's kind of like crazy that Clayman and... I don't know, Clayman just seems so fucking weak compared to Leon, yet he was like, they're like, quote unquote, rivals. Ah, they're not rivals. They're just keeping tabs on each other because Leon fucking hates him too, I guess. Now, when it comes to his relationship with the other demon lords, there is a bit of history that Leon was explained to have shared with Ramorous back at the end of season one, but I think revealing that information. Yeah, that was something about the, uh, what I said earlier about, we were talking about how different beings became a demon lord and talking about like a hero that fell from grace and then became a demon lord was Leon's lore, I think. Mation will spoil elements of Leon's character that they're saving for later. Okay. So, the next demon lord to be introduced after Clayman. Leon was none other than the marionette master himself, Clayman. Another self-proclaimed demon lord who made his entrance a century or so prior to Leon. Since he's one of the few demon lords that we actually know quite a bit about though, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you about his powers of manipulation or desire to scheme his way to the top. Did you know Clayman loves to bake scones? He has a pink apron, he has pink mitts, and he's a very delicate fella. Something you may not know instead though is just how refined of a thinker he really is. I mean, even Rimuru had come to acknowledge his potential genius when he heard how he treated his territory's economy. As one of the only demon lords who allowed free and legal commerce, oh. it was pretty clear that Clayman knew what he was doing when it came to running extremely large operations. All right, here comes the Clayman Glaze. He was very good as a economic leader. He had even managed to build trade relations with the Eastern Empire. Wow. So there's definitely more to his tactical brilliance than just deception and manipulation. Moving on to the trio of demon lords from Clayman's personal summit, it's the duo of Frey and Carrion that have a fairly interesting origin. You see, back when the world was in a constant state of conflict, Medium there were story. numerous characters who would declare themselves demon lords only to be taken out. <laughs> what? You, did you actually just get rid of Anos here? Come on, I know he's just popping out random other anime characters for the sake of examples, but Anos got taken out? Characters ...who would declare themselves demon lords only to be taken out shortly after. It was an era- <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. He said psych? He said, wait, 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 wait. ...taken out shortly after. Psych. Anos doesn't lose. True. True. It was an era of pandemonium referred to as the Great World War. Great a World fabled War. event that's said to occur only every 500 years. Every 500 years. So we have the Great Tenma War, which happens with angels attacking when civilization gets too civilized. And then there's also the Great World War, which happens every 500 years. Really? Oh, okay. So, with this one being 400 years ago, Carrion and Frey were two of the emerging survivors allowed to join the infamous Demon Lord Club. They were the first two of the newest generation followed by Clayman and Leon. As for the older generations, well, let's just say that they've been around for at least two world wars or longer. Damn! In any case, first we have the Beastmaster Kedion, the leader of the Lycanthropes and ruler of the Beast Kingdom, Eurasania. Over the past several centuries as this nation's ruler, Numerous battles were fought which had then served to expand his influence. Uh Carry Carrion is so unfortunate because he is probably really strong, absolutely, right? But because he got bodied by Milim so easily, like, and it makes sense that he would lose to Milim. Milim is one of the strongest beings in this world. Carrion just seems like a little bit of like a mobber now, right? He seems like a jobber demon lord from the way that the anime is representing. Like, Sky Queen, Carry On, you know, Clayman, they're kind of like low bottom tier compared to everyone else, even though they are still strong in their own regards. Eventually earning him respect from both the Cursed Lord and Milam herself. So, with two current Demon Lords endorsing his power, Kedion now had enough backing to solidify his position as a Demon Lord permanently. Yes, Leon did have some objection to this, but he was- <laughs> well Leon said, no, I will be the only blonde demon lord in this group. I will not have Carrion here. I reject. Wasn't going to protest it since he knew that Carrion had earned his spot properly. It was a perspective of a fellow demon lord that Carrion also had towards Leon. It's not like he was really fond of Leon as a person, but his keen eye for powerful people made him accept Leon for the power that he had. 
So when he saw that Leon was constantly increasing his own nation's forces, Kedion's instincts made him feel obliged to do the same. He wasn't really nervous of an impending attack, but he did feel a natural compulsion to fortify his kingdom to the point that any threats could be easily neutralized. Any threats could be easily neutralized. And then the Eurozani just got wiped out by Milim's attack. It's not fair, right? You can't compare Milim's attack to any threat, but like, it's funny. Like, you did all that shit. Now it got mowed down. Now you're serving Milim. Ain't so bad, actually. It became this constant desire to accumulate as much strength as possible. That's why when Clayman had offered a proposal that gave Anonys really loves using this one scene with Milim's ass crack. Him exactly that. He was more than willing to take part in whatever devious plan that he had come up with. Keep in mind though that this wasn't with the intent to do something fully evil like how Clayman was planning. It was more like an additional precaution that he thought would help to keep the other demon lords in check. You see, Kedion wasn't quite the same man that he was 400 years ago. Oh. Back then, he really only declared himself a demon lord for the sake of acquiring more power. As time went on though, that desire for power which was only for the sake of being strong, eventually shifted towards being for the sake of his people. Yeah, carry on honestly, like from the beginning, he seemed like a genuinely good person. When did we see him first? At the end of Kadiburi's arc, right? Milim took down Kadiburi and then carry on shows out of nowhere and then we get a peace with both two demon lords. And he just seemed always like a, a reasonable person, right? I never thought that he was like an evil person or some bad guy, but like a generous leader. Time had turned this power hungry fuck phobio though. Still sucks. Beastmaster into this increasingly benevolent king. Now, moving on to the Sky Queen, right? Sky Queen, as Clayman would say. Not only is she the absolute ruler of the Harpies and their kingdom Philbrosia, but she also possesses a level of Harpies are in the kingdom of Philbrosia. Can we expect Harpies to show up in season 3 party festival arc? Running an intelligence that makes her much more of a tactical leader than even Clayman. Unlike how Clayman often becomes blinded by his own overconfidence, Frey has observational skills that allow her to see straight through anyone who would try to yeah. deceive her. They're not the type of skills that are gifted to her by the world, but instead simply a natural talent to understand a person's true intention. No skill. It's just pure vibes, a woman's instinct, a harpy's instinct. Making her the only person at the Demon Lord Summit that- Damn, Frey looks really good in the manga, man. This is the manga, right? Her design is crazy good. Clayman felt he needed to be careful of. In regards to the kingdom that she runs, its harpy society is well known for being extremely classist. Any oh? creature with wings would always get preferential treatment over those without. <laughs> it didn't matter how strong of a Majin you were, because if you didn't have wings then you were simply seen as a lesser member of society. That's pretty interesting in Harpy society. They're, they're all ra- I, I guess- Are they racist? Well, they're classist, right? If you don't have wings, you're a fucking peasant, so you better have wings. When it comes to Frey herself, not only are her skills in aerial combat outmatched by very few, but her proficiency with magic is nothing to be scoffed at either. Combine this with her intrinsic ability to negate any flight-based magic, and she'll pretty much always have the advantage over any creature that doesn't have physical wings. What? Did you just say? What? Whoa, 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 whoa. Combine this with her intrinsic ability to negate any flight-based magic, and she Negate flight-based magic? As in... Any magic that obviously helps you fly. I, I guess. This sounds like an incredible skill though to counter if you're doing sky combat. She'll pretty much always have the advantage over any creature that doesn't have physical wings. Sky queen indeed. That's why as a kingdom built high into the top of a mountain, their only natural enemy is the calamity level monster Charybdis. In fact, Charybdis, which is probably the way, I don't know, I just always says Kadiburis because the anime says it that way. Act. This was actually the whole reason why Frey had even went with Milim to the Demon Lord Summit in the first place. Just like how Cadion was looking out for his own nation, so too was Frey looking out for hers. Because she was now both a Demon Lord and a Queen, she knew that she could no longer afford to lead her armies into battle like how she usually did. She understood that she now carried the responsibility to keep her people safe. So, even though she didn't like being the one who Combat followed form. Milim and cleaned up her mess, she didn't really have a problem doing it so long as it meant keeping this powerful ally close. It was really nothing more than just an inconvenient byproduct, one that had come with the rule of strictly prohibiting herself from entering battle. Only if her victory was 100% assured would Frey ever even dare to consider placing herself into the picture. 
That was just the way that she worked now. Very cunning woman. Picks battles that she can 100% for sure win. I like Frey. I like Frey and Milim. They seem like very just... I don't know. They, 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 are they friends? I think that's Frey seems Milim as a friend. Right? I think, I think Sky Queen understands how Milim is so strong and definitely values her. But like, it, it, feel, it feels like more like friendship, you know? It feels nice. Despite the next Demon Lord being the Destroyer Milim, oh, to talk about is. her would require a video of its own. And you should make a separate video so I can farm that. I mean, there's quite a bit more to this special s rank Dragonborn than just incomparable power. So instead, we'll just skip ahead to the Fairy Queen Ramorous. Whoa! Milim actually got skipped. That's fucked up. No, no, no. Milim and Ramorous is going to get the same thing because Mil Ramorous is part of the lore with Milim with the, you know, the... Uh the lore, remember? With the dead dragon and stuff? One of the more powerful demon lords from the older generation. Fairy queen. When it comes to how she became what she is now. Well, her story brings us all the way back to the time when Milam had first awakened as a true demon lord. A time thousands of years ago when Milam's rage had threatened the very existence of all life entirely. With her newfound power spiraling out of control, Gi was forced to step in and try to subdue her in a battle that would last exactly a week. One week battle. I hope we get to. Ever, I hope we get to see. I don't. I don't want an actual episode dedicated to a week of fighting, but like, I do want to see it get animated. There was no decisive victor by the end of it, but the fight did come to an end when Milim was. Like, look at Ramorous back in the past with this art, man. That's Milim, Guy Crimson, Ramorous. Eventually, able to regain her senses, a result that was only achieved due to the efforts and sacrifice of Ramorous, as a very high-level leader of the spirits. Ramorous had chosen to sacrifice her own power in exchange for the neutralization of Milam's rage. Wait! Really? So... That's why Ramorous is no longer in this form? She's in pixie mode? Because she sacrificed her powers? For Milam? As a very high-level leader of the spirits, Ramorous had chosen to sacrifice her own power in exchange for the neutralization of Milam's rage. But having been exposed to such intense auras from both demon and dragon, Ramorous's core had ended up becoming corrupted, thus oh. changing her very existence into something different. Oh. So, not only was she drained of whatever force had made her so strong, but she was also turned into this continuously self-resurrecting fairy. A reincarnation of her former self that only possessed a small fraction of the power that she used to have. That's crazy, because Ramorous is super strong. Even in this form, she's still pretty strong, I think, right? But this is like a really, really, really nerfed state. How do we get Prime Ramorous back? That'd be really cool to see in the anime. All because she was the demon lord who truly believed in promoting balance in the world. Of course, she wasn't a demon balance. lord back then, but this was the incident that had gained her the recognition of one. It was here that the world was introduced to what's now known as the first generation of demon lords. So, alongside Milam and Ramorous, we also have the demon lord whose goal is to find the farthest reaches of power. The absolute ruler of the frozen continent to the north, and the oldest and strongest of all the demon lords, Guy Crimson. Lord of Darkness, he is a demon lord. He's a demon that became a demon lord. Primordial Red, Rouge. Now, as you'd expect from the only demon lord who's, well, actually- The first demon lord, tale of an ancient king's past. The demon. This lord of darkness tends to fill his ranks with all sorts of greater demons and archdemons. It is so cool though, like when, when we were like entering Walpurgis almost, and we, we had that episode where Leon Cromwell was entering like Guy Crimson's palace, like all like the entourage of all the greater and arc demons, bro. That was so sick. And little did I know that the maids were even like the strongest amongst them too. Like primordial. Some of which are even powerful enough to be demon lords themselves. Yeah. Even so, the difference in power between them and Guy is so large that none would even dare to speak freely while in his presence. Demon society is so elite and well-mannered. Very sophisticated. To even display any sort of emotion without his express permission was essentially the same thing as asking for their immediate death. <laughs> in fact, if an opposing demon lord was to start attacking Gi right in front of their face, not a single one would move since to worry for Gi's safety would be to disrespect his power. That's crazy. If someone tried to save Gi, it would be a sign of disrespect and Gi would be like, Oh, so you thought that I would get hit by that and I'd take damage. How dare you? You need to die right now. That is such a level of respect that I can't even fathom. And that was the most grave mistake that any person could ever make. 
As for how it is he gained all this power, well, that takes us back to long before he'd even awakened as a true demon lord. Uh, some shit like Diablo was saying, right? Uh, in order to become... No, that's not some demon pure shit, I forget. Diablo was saying, like, you know, uh, be born as a demon and just continuously win. Just for 2,000 fucking years, right? You see, Gi was first summoned to the world as an unnamed archdemon. Okay. But more than that, he was also one of the seven primal demons that had a color associated with them. A primal demon can also be summoned as an archdemon. I thought that a primal demon is already a primordial demon. But he got summoned as an archdemon. More lore. Okay, wait, hold up. His, of course, being the color rouge. Now, the reason why he'd been summoned in the first place was specifically to fulfill the wishes of the powerless human that summoned him. Who? A petty wish involving the destruction of the nation his summoner was currently at war with. Gi had no issue making that wish come true, but he immediately followed it up by wiping out his summoner's nation as well. <laughs> it was a feat of pure carnage and destruction that not only earned him the name of Gi, but also allowed him to awaken into his new class of true demon lord. All the sacrifices there were served for his demon seed? Since Gi already considered himself to be the strongest though, an evolution like this didn't really mean much to him. He was more so interested in the ultimate skills that could potentially come with it. So, you're telling me the ascendancy into true demon lord, he wasn't even phased by it. Because he was already so unfathomably strong, his evolution was like insignificant. But the ultimate skills that come with it are obviously pretty important, and I doubt he's going to tell us the ultimate skills, right? That's why he tends to hold anyone who possesses one in very high regard. Mm. In any case, it was Gi, Milam, and Ramorous who would go on to represent the first generation. Yo, the initial geez. group of demon lords that would lay the foundations for all the others. So, soon after they had established themselves as the world's pillars of strength, a second generation would eventually emerge to join them. Of all these dudes, I'm very interested in Dino. First, there was the holy giant de Gruul. And according to Anius's imagery before, of people that can't have, like, a demon lord seed, this guy also can't? Something about him just can't? A being so imbued with what's known as the Holy Element that it wasn't even possible for a Demon Lord seat to take root in his body. Holy Element? What? He's super religious? He's super holy? Why is he- why would a holy person be a fucking Demon Lord? Ah, it's just a title. Anyways. That means that he could... Never... No, 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 no. Hold up, hold up, hold up. I, I, am I getting my lore wrong? The ultimate skills are something that's gained through sometimes evolving into true demon lore. But does that mean that this dude can't have an ultimate skill because he cannot ascend into true demon lord? Or is that not the only way that one can gain an ultimate skill? Because that would be a huge fucking handy. Because like, I doubt Ramirez, Ramirez definitely does have a fucking ultimate skill, right? Like, she is one of the OGs. But because physical, you know, her, her spirit makeup, she, she, she can't have Demon Lord Seed. So she can't be true Demon Lord. So she's kind of stuck at Demon Lord titles, right? I, I, I wonder the ultimate skill, you know, link here. Making it impossible for him to ever become a true Demon Lord. Despite that being the case, though, De Grille's raw power as the protector of the Gates to Heaven was more than enough to- The Gates to Heaven. This motherfucker is the one that's protecting these fucking flying insects. The ten ma war bullshit with the angels. He protects the gates. He's saying super important. Take me to the gates of heaven. That's an actual place that exists. This is getting super interesting now. To earn him recognition from the other demon lords. And Veldra also mentioned him as one of the few people that was like worthy, right? Veldra. I remember in season 2 was talking about a couple demon lords. This guy was there. Uh, Luminous was one of them. And then maybe Dino? I'm not sure. But he was definitely one of the few that was acknowledged. And was more than enough to earn him recognition from the other demon lords. The next to join after him was the ancient vampire who I'll simply refer to as the Queen of Nightmares. Queen a true Nightmares. demon lord whose position was currently being occupied by the bloody lord Roy Valentine. And obviously they're not gonna- well, this is two years ago, right? I want- because like, we know this is a fake. 
the real is luminous, but anyways. There isn't really much to say about who either of them are, but apparently Roy had taken over for this Queen of Nightmares approximately 1500 years ago. The Queen of Nightmares in context is luminous, right? Or is it a different figure? Right? Because this, this is luminous, right? This, this is luminous, right? The Queen of Nightmares? Yeah, 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 yeah. Then finally, we have the last of the second generation. Dino. Dino. A fallen angel whose strength made him more than- FALLEN ANGEL?! Hold the fuck up! Whoa, 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 whoa! Yo, stop! Stop! This sounds like- <laughs> That girl fucking holding the gates of heaven? Dino the fallen angel? Two demon lords that directly connect to the fucking angels? We, we need to know more about them, but they're probably not gonna get any spotlight for a while, man. Than capable of commanding an empire, but never actually got around to doing it due to his complete lack of interest. He was simply a powerful individual too lazy to do anything about it. <laughs> Bro's just tired all the time. It, there must be a reason why he's like tired, right? Is it because of his powers that makes him so fucking tired? But he's like, yeah, I'm just too sleepy. I don't want to do anything. So rather than amass an army, did he become a fall? Did he get kicked out of the pearly gates of heaven? Because he was a lazy motherfucker that always napped, and then he became a fallen angel? I don't know how that works. Your acquired territory. Dino instead just tends to be a bystander, usually spending the majority of his time sleeping. Yeah. But anyway. I refuse to believe he was sleeping here, though. Here? He was acting as if he was sleeping, but looking at Frey instead. That's my headcanon. You can't see Frey. There's Frey. There's Frey right there. Spending the majority of his time sleeping. But anyway, that's every member of the second generation. A group of more veteran demon lords who have been around for more than a few great wars now. So, just on that fact alone, they're far more experienced than any of the demon lords to come after them. Well, most of them anyway. Rimuru. But yeah, that's pretty much everything that I've got. Nothing about Rimuru? Well, you know, it's not about the past ones. So, this one was a pretty interesting one. I think the most interesting, and guys, go give Mr. Andy New some likes on his videos. I think the most interesting demon lord to me, well, the most interesting thing that I learned was like how Ramidus literally did not have the ability to become a fucking demon lord, true demon lord status because of lack of seed, right? Can't have a seed. Same with that giant guy and how he is protecting the gates of heaven. Like this is an actual position. It, it, like a gates of heaven exist. And then that Dino is a fallen angel. Anything that links to heaven or angels is just like so fascinating to me, which just means that we're not gonna get anything about them until like season four, season five. That's it from me. See you next time.